Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, last week when we got together, we, we started talking about this notion of a confidence interval. And we said that basically we're going to come up with some minimum value and some maximum value that will encompass, that will put brackets around what we think is the population parameter that we're interested in. And, and that parameter could be a standard deviation, it could be range, it could be a proportion, a mean, it can be any any population parameter that we we find of interest or find important to us. Um, in this course, we're going to focus primarily on um, the mean and uh, uh, proportion, but don't don't walk away from here thinking that's the only thing um, that you can use a confidence interval for. You can you can use it to define or or uh, approximate any population parameter. Um, we just happen to use the mean and the proportion most often. Um, and in real life, those are two really, really important parameters that you're interested in. Um, so, it, but I don't want to walk away thinking that the, these are the only two that are important or these are the only two you'll ever come across. So to introduce the idea of this of this range of values, um, I introduce to you the uh, idea of randomly selecting values from a population uh, for which you don't know the mean, but you have an idea of what the mean is. And we went through that in detail um, on Friday. I won't I won't go through that again. But uh, several of you have um, have added um, added your your estimates or your guesses for that mystery mean, and so uh, what I want to do is I want to share with you what we've got and kind of look at the data, and then we'll come up with um, we'll come up with an interval that we think captures captures the mean and. Um, see how that works for us. So um, let me um, turn on the screen share here. So the first thing I want to go to is um, uh, I want to show you the spreadsheet that uh, you guys have been entering. So um, first row, those were my hints. Um, all of these values you guys have come up with and you've supplied me as your as your guesses for this particular uh, mystery mean. And I see uh, Skylar's added some, so good. I'll, um, I'll incorporate that and we'll see how that changes uh, the picture of our data. So what I've done is you've seen me use Fathom software in the past and um, uh, so I've created this uh, this collection of data. I called it the mystery mean. And here I've, I've just taken your values and entered them here. So let me add um, let me add Skylar's values uh, to 29. And you should see you should see these values popping up on the dot plot as I enter them. Um, and 233. Okay, so um, there's our values, um, and here they are on a dot plot. So that's, that is, um, I think this is the best way for us to kind of visualize uh, where our data is, and we can get, um, get a pretty good estimate just by looking at the value. Um, or, or looking at the graph and say, okay, I, I see the data seems to be centered, I don't know, somewhere maybe uh, 235 is certainly the tall tent pole, but I've got some values over here that are going to pull the middle of the data maybe to the left. So uh, I, I'm going to guess a mean um, of, I don't know, two. 
234 or something like that. Um, so um, now, now that we've got this data, the first thing we're going to start with is a, a point estimate. Your textbook talks about a point estimator or a point estimate. And basically, it's a single value that represents the population parameter um, that we're seeking. And so in this case, um, we could come up with several uh, point estimators. For example, one might be the median. We could take this data. We've got, I think, 32 spots. So we could go and calculate the um, go and calculate the median and find that dot. Um, but honestly, um, we're we're trying to find a mystery mean. So um, let's just use as our point estimator the average or the mean of the data that we've that we've collected here. And the cool thing about um, uh, Fathom is it, it allows me to calculate that. I'm going to give it a name. I'll call it X bar. And over here, um, I'll just create a quick formula. And y'all don't have to, don't, don't worry about what you see going on here. You'll never have to have to use um, Fathom or anything like that. So um, just, uh, just follow along. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the mean of this variable I call guesses. And uh, it'll give me it'll give me a value, and sure enough, there it is. Two thirty three point four um, is the mean of the data that you have um, that you have provided me. And so, this value here would be our point estimator for our population parameter. Now, um, every time every time I uh, take a new sample, this point estimator may change um, depending on the data that, that gets added. It, it will change some amount, whether it changes materially or not, I guess, depends on the next, uh, next set of data. But um, so we'll just call X bar our point estimator. And for right now, that is our best guess of this mystery mean. So it would show up... Um, Let's see, there's 232, so this is 233 right here. So I'm just going to highlight that value for just, just a minute. We can kind of see, um, yeah, that looks like it's kind of in the middle of the data. Notice there's, there's more data over here, but these two lower values tend to really pull this mean to the left. So we might, we might say that this is slightly skewed to the left, but we're not, we're not too worried about that right now. Um, but um, so now what we want to do to put a bracket around where we think this mystery value is, um, we want to come up with some uh, methodical, some reasonable method of encapsulating the data. And um, if you go back to uh, go back to the, one of the very first things we did in um, in calculating values, we talked about the empirical rule. And, and I told you then, I said, look, we're going to be talking about the empirical rule up to the very last day. And and here we are again. We're talking about the empirical rule. And just to remind you, the empirical rule says that. Um, uh, for roughly symmetric data, um, especially data that's normally distributed, then we would expect um, about 68% of the data to be captured within plus or minus one standard deviation. We would expect about 95% of the data to be captured within plus or minus two, and then 99.7 to be captured within plus or minus three standard deviations of the true mean. Well, we don't know what the true mean is. I'm, I'm keeping that secret from you. But what we can do is we can use this point estimator as kind of an anchor. Um, and um, 
as a um, uh, as a, an anchor point for setting those upper or those lower and those upper limits. Now the question is, um, what do we want to use as a reasonable window or as a as a um, as a value that makes sense? Well, it really depends on what degree of confidence do we need um, that we've captured our value? Is it okay for us to be 68% sure? And I'm using that term 68% sure pretty loosely. By the end of class, I'll define it pretty formally for you. But for right now, is it okay that we're 68% sure that we've, we've captured the true population parameter? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so I would ask, okay, what about 95% sure? Hmm, that sounds better to me, better than 68. I mean, 68 is only about two thirds of the data. And honestly, I think I would rather have more than that, but some search circumstances, 68% might be fine. But ordinarily, ordinarily we hover um, around a value like 95%. It captures um, two standard deviations of the data. Uh, we've found already that um, uh, values that land outside of two standard deviations are, are fairly rare. And so uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll deal with or we'll settle on this 95% confidence level. If, however, we need to be more sure then we'll go to a confidence level like 99%. Um, and that really, really, really gets down to the nitty gritty in terms of uh, our level of confidence. The, the drawback is um, at 99% confidence, uh, it requires a lot of data um, for us to have that level of confidence. And you'll, you'll see that in a minute. So, for right now, let's just say we want we want 95% confidence that we've captured this mystery mean. And so 95% confidence tells us we're looking for plus or minus two standard deviations from this from this point estimator, from this anchor point. So the question is, what standard deviation are we going to use? Um, well, we said we said that we were taking our data from a um, a distribution that had a um, let's see oh, let's go back up here yeah there we go we're taking our we were taking our data from a distribution with an unknown M and a standard de standard deviation of 20, but we're taking 16 samples. So we're creating a sampling distribution of all of those values. And so the mean, the mean of our sampling distribution is going to be our population mean. The standard deviation now of this sampling distribution is no longer 20, it's a value that is the is 20 divided by the square root of 16. Square root of 16 is 4, 20 divided by 4 is 5. So our sampling distribution standard deviation now uh, is going to be 5. So we're going to take this anchor point and we're going to look at plus or minus um, two standard deviations or minus two times five or 10 and plus 10. So we're gonna go 233 minus 10. And so that gets us to 223. This guy here is at 223. So there's, there's, the, there's the lower bound and the upper bound is gonna be at 243. And we don't have a 243, we've got a 242. So the upper and lower bounds are here and here. And if we look at those two dots, we say, yeah, we've got there are only three out of the 32 data points that we collected 
that are excluded from the value. So I look at that and say, yeah, I, I feel pretty confident that the true mean, the actual mean, is going to be captured between these two values. And um, so we would say in this case that our confidence interval is um, our point estimator 233 plus or minus two standard deviations or plus or minus 10. So our interval is going to be 223 to 243. And, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll talk in a little bit about how we express that, how we, um, how we um, define that in terms, of, in terms of context. But right now, I just want you to get the idea that the min and max here are 223 and 243. And what does that represent? Well, that represents that we think that the true population mean or the true uh, value that we're looking for resides somewhere between 233 or yeah 233 at the bottom and 243 at the top end somewhere in between there between 223 and 243 we're we have a confidence of 95 percent that the true value is there and so um uh that's what that's this whole idea of what confidence interval is is it's it's a range of values that we have arrived at based on our statistical calculations of of a point estimator in this case we just took the the mean of the values of for the guesses that you guys came up with we could have defined some other point estimator but this one seemed reasonable i think and then we from that anchor point from that 233 value we um, we went to the left, two standard deviations using our sampling distribution standard deviation. Uh, we went to the left by that amount and we went to the right by that amount and then we set our brackets for that. So I guess the question is, how well did we do? Well, um, let's see. Um, uh, I will. I promise you that I told I would uh, tell you where the mystery mean came from. And I was looking around my, my room the other day and I came across one of uh, Courtney's favorite books when she was a teenager. It was the book Holes by um, uh, Louis Sakar. I think many of you might have seen the movie back in the day when you were when you were kids. And it turns out that the last page of, um, of this book is page 233. And so that's the value I picked for our mystery mean. And look, it's amazing. It, 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 statistics never ceases to amaze me. But we came up with this method and um, uh, we decided we were going to um, we were going to go through this whole process and sure enough, we, using all of this data, that government, we came up right on top of the unknown value. And so I guess I'm quite honestly, I'm surprised that we got this close. It, we've done this before and we get, usually get very, very close um, to the to the unknown value, but I don't think I've ever had a case where we got exactly this close. Um, but to me, that's just one of the reasons I love teaching this class is it's so doggone powerful that we can uh, we can use the techniques here to estimate a, a population parameter that at the beginning you guys had no idea what that value is. Uh, we go through um, a method of collecting some random samples of a size n equals 16, which is it's not large. The central limit theorem would say mm, that's probably not large enough to 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 know that our um, population is normally distributed if we didn't already know that it was normally distributed. 
But I told you it was normally distributed to begin with. Remember, we, we picked our values from a distribution that was normal. And so if that's the case, we know that the mean of the sampling distribution um, or the shape of the sampling distribution is going to be normally distributed. So we go through this process and uh, after 32 iterations or 32 samples, we literally hit the nail right on the head. And um, I, I guess it never ceases to amaze me how useful and how how accurate these these techniques are for us okay so so with 95 percent confidence we would have said that our mystery value was somewhere between 223 and 243 and sure enough it was a 233 um, and that happened to be um, exactly the value that we were looking for okay so hopefully these images and what I'll do um, uh, after we get done here, I'll, I'll try to post some of these um, value, these uh, images um, uh, from here and maybe, well, you can, you can go back and look at, you can look at this anytime since I shared it with you. But uh, I think this one is pretty powerful. The dot plot of our data um, is pretty powerful and helpful for us to look at. Notice in the real world, even though we're drawing from a normally dis distributed uh, data set, that our, our samples, um, after 32 samples, mm, I, I, you know, you, you see a hump here right around the middle, but we've got some crazy ones going on to the left. Um, so, you know, in the real world, we don't always get that perfect uh, bell-shaped, single-peaked curve, and we have to make some decisions about, you know, what, where does it, what does our data really look like? Um, so here's, um, here's what, um, what we can learn, is that um, we can take a population parameter, come up with some way of identifying a point estimate for that parameter, use that as the anchor for an interval defined as a min and a max that with a certain level of confidence puts brackets around that. And we can say somewhere in between those two values with 95% confidence, uh, we think that the true population parameter is, is hidden somewhere inside there. Don't know where, is it on the left end, the right end, is it dead smack in the middle? Well, we don't know, but we know that it's somewhere in that interval. So um, let's uh, let's take a look at um, another another graph. And I, I'm going to be honest with you; these are these are notes from a previous class. Which, if we had been together, you would have you'd be taking them uh, yourself. But um, it's just so hard for me to write without uh, write clearly without a smart board. I've just decided to just kind of reuse last year's notes. And, and uh, if you find it useful, I can snap these pages and send them to you as notes. But quite honestly, um, my outline here follows our textbook pretty well. So um, we'll just, we can just go by the textbook. So if you want to turn to your textbook, we're on um, uh, page 472 is where we'll, what we'll be focusing on for right now, but um, you don't have to turn there. You can just kind of follow along. So to define the confidence interval, we're going to come up with that point estimator, that anchor point for our value. Usually it's X bar or P hat. It doesn't have to be that, but usually it is. And then from that anchor point, we're going to come up with some way to create an interval to capture that, that true population parameter. And so that interval takes, we can, we can write it in many ways. We can write it as I had it on the board behind me as a, um, as an ordered pair, a left and a right value, a min and a max. But most often we see it this way. We see it as the estimate, the point estimator, plus or minus something called a margin of error. 
And that might be, if you remember back to our Gallup poll um, review, you know, they always talked about a margin of error of 2% or 2.5% or maybe 5%. Well, that's what they're talking about here. It is the level of uncertainty we have surrounding this point estimator. Here's our point estimator, X bar. And then there's this, there's this range of uncertainty that lies to the left and to the right of it. That's what margin of error means. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to come up with ways to calculate this value from a set of data. But for right now, uh, we'll just talk about um, this margin of error as the level of, of variability surrounding our point estimator. And so what I want to show you now is, is perhaps uh, one of the most um, – one of the most important graphs in, in this whole textbook in terms of understanding um, uh, a, a concept like confidence interval. So every time we take a new sample of a particular size, every time we take a, a sample of size equals 16, n equals 16, um, we'll get a new interval um, and that sample itself will contain a max and a min. If you remember, when you guys, when you guys would calculate your individual samples here, I don't know if you took the time to look at the data before you calculated the mean, but there was a min and a max value in that sample of 16 data points. Um, and so in this sample of 16 data points, there was a min and a max value inside that sample. Well, what the confidence interval says is every time I take a new sample, here's my, here's my sampling distribution. Um, and the, the mean of the population happens to line up uh, right, in the, right in the middle of the sampling distribution by definition. The mean of X bar is the mean of the population. Um, and in this case, we know it's normally distributed because the population from which we drew it was normally distributed. And every time we take a sample, we get a new X bar. And that's what these intervals, these horizontal lines here are, is they are individual samples drawn from this, this, from this population. And the red dot, the red dot here and here and here and here represents the, um, the X bar of each individual sample. And the, the left and the right endpoint of the bar represents the min and the max. And so what we're, what we're saying with this confidence interval is that every time we draw a new sample, somewhere in between the min and the max, should be the population mean. And if you, and you notice here that for the majority, the very large majority of all of our samples, even though the sample mean is kind of far from the left to the right of the true mean, the true mean is in fact captured inside that interval. It's captured here, 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 all the way up. There's only one sample drawn from that distribution that doesn't capture the true mean represented by this vertical line here. And so what that does is that tells us that repeated samples will define individual intervals for each sample that create a pattern where 95% of the intervals capture the true mean. In other words, what that's doing is every time we take a new sample from our population, um, we're creating a horizontal estimate. And, and that estimate, that min and that max, is going to capture the true mean about 95% of the time if we use plus or minus two standard deviations for our range of variability. If we use plus or minus one, then about 68% of the samples will capture the true mean. If we use plus or minus three standard deviations, 
then about 99% of the, of the samples will capture the true mean. Now, I'm not saying that the, the, the X bar of any particular individual sample is going to line up here. What I'm saying is that somewhere between the min and the max um, is going to be that true population mean. And you can see that, you can see that here as almost all of these samples. And I think if you take time to count, there are 20 of them and only one of them doesn't capture the true mean. So that really is a ratio of, of 95% uh, capture the mean. Now, obviously that's a bit contrived here, but the, the point is this pattern of samples that we create by repeated sampling over and over and over, this pattern yields for us uh, a picture of where the true mean really lies. And we can be confident, we can have a confidence level of 95% that the true mean is in, in between these mins and maxes each time we take a new sample. And so if you look at, um, if you look at uh, the, uh, the definition box on the bottom of page 472, I think I've got it captured. No, this is an example. Okay, so I don't I don't have that particular box, but just, let me just um, uh, read uh, through here a confidence interval, margin of error, confidence level. The confidence interval uh, contains the two parts. It contains the point estimate and a margin of error. Okay. And the margin of error, how close the estimate tends to be to the unknown parameter in repeated random sampling. So after, if we continue this sampling over and over and over again, um, this margin of error represents the, the range with, what, with which we think the, the true population parameter sits. And then confidence level. You'll notice that I've got confidence level written here. Confidence level is, uh, it's a little bit different. It's a different way of saying the same thing. And quite honestly, um, it, it's important that you know the distinction. Um, and so a confidence level uh, rate of the method of calculating the confidence interval. In other words, how many, what percent of the samples will actually contain the true mean? That's, that's kind of a good idea of the confidence level. What per percent of the samples will capture the true mean? And if you look at it, it says uh, that is um, in C percent or say 95 percent of all possible samples the method would yield an interval that captures the true parameter value. So our sampling method uh, is robust enough that in about 95% of samples, uh, we're going to capture the true mean. Um, and so um, what I want to do at this point is I, I, I want to, um, we're, we've been at this for a good while now. I've thrown quite a bit of information at you. Uh, what I want you to do is flip over in your text um, to page 481. And um, I'll go ahead and um, stop sharing now. Um, we'll get back to classroom here. Um, so what I want you to do, turn over to page 481, and I want you to work through one of these uh, exercises, and it happens to be number five, talking about the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Now, when you look at that, there's a lot of words here. Don't be, don't be overwhelmed by the words. Um, the steps are pretty straightforward. Um, I won't go into the details. I'll let you kind of digest the details. But um, this National Assessment of Educational Pro Progress allows us to um, uh, 
define uh, the skill level of students at a variety of different educational skills. For example, their math skill and the scores are on a range from zero to 500. You can, you can read through that. So we have a particular um, test um, to a simple random sample of 840 people from a large population. Okay, so that's a that's a key. It's from a large population, uh, and you get the mean and a certain standard deviation. Um, and remember that if you give that test again to another 840 people, you're going to get a different mean, just like just like that one graph where the horizontal lines they they slide to the right, they slide to the left. Every sample has its own sample mean, what we're hoping for is that the accumulation of all of those samples in between the left and right or the min and max, um, somewhere inside there is, um, is, is the true mean. And so part A, describe the shape, center, and spread of the sampling distribution of X bar by now, I hope that's pretty familiar to you. That's what we've been doing uh, all along from the last chapter. Sketch the sampling distribution of X bar. Well, how do you do that? Well, you know the mean and the standard deviation. And so you can sketch that. And then we're going to go back in part C to the uh, empirical rule. About 95% of the values uh, of X bar lie within a distance M of the mean. What is that value? Okay, well, if you take uh, the 95% level um, and you calculate the width of that interval, what is, what is that interval? Uh, that's the value for M. And then part D, whenever X bar falls in, you're going to shade the region. Uh, the population mean lies within the confidence interval X bar plus or minus M. And so what I want you to do is in part D, you'll write this in confidence interval form where you have the estimate plus or minus some, um, some margin of error. And so M stands for margin of error. So I want you to work for today, uh, work your way through that. Uh, tomorrow, if you have questions or between now and tomorrow, you can send me, you can send me your questions. I'll be, be checking classroom. Um, but um, I think this is a really good way to formalize uh, what we talked about today and um, make sure that the things we talked about are kind of sinking in. Um, now, like I said, there's a lot of words here, and this may appear to be a pretty big task, but think back to the example. All we did, all we did is we, um, we created a sampling distribution by taking repeated samples uh, from a normal distribution, and um, even if this distribution is not normal, we should be confident that the sampling distribution has a particular shape because of the number of samples we take. And um, we can rely on the calculations we did in the previous chapter to give us the uh, center and spread of the sampling distribution of X bar and kind of walk your way through. Now, again, if you've got questions, let me know. Uh, but otherwise, let's... Um, uh, go through here and it's just question five. It'll take a little bit of time, I think, but um, it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be outside of our range for handling for right now. So I'll stop and I'll ask, um, uh, does anybody, anybody have any questions at this point about what I'm asking? Okay, silence from the crowd. Either I have completely lost you or I have done such a great job that there are no possible ways that uh, there's any confusion. For my own self-esteem, I'm going to assume it's the second one and we'll move ahead. Okay.
Well, uh, we'll get back together this time tomorrow. And uh, like I said, if between now and then you have any questions, feel free to shout out. Um, and um, without anything else, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. We'll sign off and um, y'all have a great rest of the day. See ya. See ya. Y'all take care. <laughs>